Welcome to Social Allo Ministries, where we are committed to glorifying God and exposing the devil. As you can see based on the topic, this is somewhat of a touchy subject. It's about how to sell your soul to the devil. Now this lesson is not to teach you how to sell your soul to the devil so you can do it. It's to teach you things the enemy tries to do to get you to come into agreement with him to effectively sell your soul to him, whether you know it or not and sometimes whether you're willing or not. In Matthew 16, verse 26, Jesus said, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So the Lord spoke about forfeiting our soul or giving something in exchange for our soul. And that's where the enemy comes in play. You may have heard stories about, for example, someone going to a certain crossroad and they had an encounter with someone who seemed like a man and they willingly made an exchange that they would have a successful movie career or music career. And maybe before they had that encounter, they could play an instrument, but they were mediocre at best. But suddenly they had that encounter and next thing you know, they were just phenomenal. Or in other cases, they were mediocre. They made that deal knowingly. And their talent didn't change, but suddenly people's appreciation for their work changed. And others may be like, hey, but I can sing better than this person. I can act better than this person. I'm more talented. I'm more qualified for this job. But this person's getting ahead. That's because they knowingly sold their soul. And a part of how this message came about was someone out of obedience sent me a testimony of a lady who said that she was involved in witchcraft for many years, starting when she was very young, because she was indoctrinated by her grandmother. So her grandmother unknowingly indoctrinated her into witchcraft. So again, there are ways of doing it knowingly and unknowingly. But as a part of this ministry, I'm not here to expose the devil and his works, because some of you are going through things and you can say the enemy has your soul caged and more about that later and you find yourself where it's like in life it's like you advance two steps but then you take ten steps backwards and it seems as if you can only go so far you literally feel like you're you're the sea or the ocean where you come to the shore where you can only get to a certain point and then it all falls apart and some of the ways to know that something's going on with the state of your soul is for example some of the ways that you either knowingly or unknowingly hand your soul over to the devil is by coming into agreement with him like engaging in things such as tarot card readings horoscopes astrology going to a medium a spiritist and when you do such things the enemy may not put a burden on you there may be no requirement. You may just give a person money or it may be done for free. But it's literally like a drug dealer giving you free drugs, hoping you'll get addicted so he or she can then start charging you. And by the way, doing drugs is another way of handing your soul over to the devil. So you may do something like reading horoscopes and the Lord may let you know something's wrong by giving you a dream. And in that dream you may find yourself being locked in a cage or being imprisoned or you may go into a bathroom and the door locks behind you but those things are symbolic of you being locked up and if you don't challenge those dreams if you don't repent of your sins if you don't renounce the sinful things that you did or even others got you involved in then essentially you just lock the key and give it to the enemy so the dream was a warning and it was an invitation from the Lord to repent to come out of agreement with the enemy but the enemy is very subtle in the Garden of Eden, as shown in Genesis 3, the devil didn't approach Eve and let her know what the consequences would, would be. He tried to get her to look at the fruit, question the word of the Lord, make it seem as if the Lord was withholding something by not having her engage in partaking a tree from knowledge of good and evil. But once she did, literally all hell broke loose. So I slow this down regarding selling your soul to the devil 
I mentioned about going to see a medium or a spiritist. The same thing also applies to seeing a false prophet. So if you know someone, not a prophet of the Lord who maybe misses it, and not say that Jonah missed it, but Jonah went to Nineveh with a bona fide word of the Lord. The Lord repented, and that word didn't come to pass. It also speaks about in 1 Samuel 3, verses 18 and 19, where it said the Lord did not allow any of Samuel's words to fall to the ground. So there are times when a prophet could miss it, and if the prophet realizes, then if that prophet is truly a prophet of the Lord, he or she will, will repent. But a false prophet will keep on telling lies and won't repent. And when you see those things that distinguishes a person between a true prophet who may have missed it, may have not perceived something the Lord said correctly, or maybe thought it was the Lord who was his enemy, so there are a bunch of factors. But if someone is legitimately a false prophet, who's not using the unction of the Holy Spirit, but is prophesying with the help of a familiar spirit, a spirit of divination, by accepting that prophecy, you come into agreement with that false prophet. And you may have even gone in for deliverance from the false prophet, whether knowingly or unknowingly. And you may have felt delivered from the evil spirit. But then you had a dream and you saw the prophet like standing in the way. We know that Balaam, Balaam was originally a prophet. In the book of Numbers, it describes him as being a prophet. In Peter's epistle, it describes him as being a prophet. But in the book of Joshua, he is described as a soothsayer. So in essentially, he, he was born a prophet, but he died a soothsayer. Some people do drift in error. But you may go to someone unknowingly who is a false prophet, using a familiar spirit, a spirit of divination. You accept a prophecy from an individual, coming into agreement with the enemy. And like Balaam, who, when he was on his way to go see Balak, his donkey saw an angel in the way, and the angel was resisting them. Likewise, you may have an encounter with a false prophet. You receive a false prophecy, and next thing you know, you have a dream or a vision of that false prophet standing in your way, a block. And it's like you just sold your soul to the enemy by coming to agreement with a false prophet and the spirit or spirits behind him, him or her. And whether it's a prophet spirit or an evil spirit in the form of that prophet, and also say this, you have to be careful of the enemy's deception because you could see an actual prophet and especially because I'm giving you this, the enemy may try to misrepresent that prophet by performing what I'm saying. So please test the spirit. But if you see a false prophet, you may have a dream or a vision of that prophet standing in your way. And it's literally because you've sold your, your soul to the enemy. You're only going to go so far. Or you may see that prophet locking you up somewhere. You become a caged soul. And I take you to the scriptures by starting off in 1 Samuel 28. This was after years of Saul being in rebellion. In 1 Samuel 13, the Lord had Samuel warn Saul and actually told him that his kingdom would no longer continue. His kingdom would no longer continue and the Lord is going to give it to someone better than him. The Lord gave Saul another chance and Samuel told Saul that his kingdom had been torn from his hand and given to one better than him. But as a part of that warning, the Lord told Saul that his rebellion, even your rebellion, is as witchcraft. Witchcraft itself is rebellion. Rebellion itself is a form of witchcraft. The two go hand in hand. So if you're rebelling against God, you're on the way, if you haven't done so already, handing your soul over to the enemy. So the Lord had Samuel tell Saul that his rebellion was as witchcraft. And the Lord was still communicating with Saul. But after a while, it got to the point where the Lord even withdrew his spirit under the old covenant from Saul. And it got to the point where after years of rebellion, trying to usurp the Lord's plans, that this happened. In 1 Samuel 28, starting verse 3, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had removed from the land those who were mediums and spiritists. So that was a good thing. 
So the Philistines gathered together and came and camped in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they camped in Gilboa. When Saul saw the camp of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. One of the henchmen, the foot soldiers for the enemy, is a spirit of fear. We know, or you should, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Saul had been battling an issue with fear all of his life. Even the day of his coronation, Saul was hiding in fear. Fear caused Saul to make a lot of mistakes. If you're wrestling with fear, ungodly fear, because there is such a thing as fear of the Lord, because fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But if you're battling an ungodly fear, you are susceptible, susceptible to the enemy. So Saul saw the Philistines and he was afraid. He was outnumbered. The enemy will try to put you in a position to make it seem as if the only way out is to compromise your standards, is to bow to him. And he'll try to use fear. Sometimes he'll present you with what seems a bigger enemy, a larger than life enemy, a formidable opponent. When Goliath was trying to torment the, the Israelites, David faced him. David was actually smaller than Saul. It would seem as if Saul was definitely smaller than Goliath, who was nine feet, six inches tall. So the enemy will also try to put you against a larger foe, try to get you to bow, try to get you to worship. Well, you can't afford to do that. So Saul already had an issue, fear. Fear allows the enemy to come in. But Saul started off right where it said, when Saul inquired of the Lord, so when you're in a position, inquire of the Lord. And sometimes you have to be still and wait. The Lord did not answer him. So all of Saul's rebellion had gotten him in trouble. So now the Lord was answering him. Either by dreams, I mentioned about dreams earlier, very important to monitor your dreams regarding to know what the enemy has done or is trying to do to you, and also for the Lord. So not by dreams, or by Urim, or by prophets. So if you are in rebellion, you may seek a prophet with a tremendous gift, and the Lord may hide information from the prophet, and may not have anything to say to you, unless you repent. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. So because he wasn't hearing from the Lord, he was going to try to seek a medium. The enemy will try to get you to do that. Where maybe you're hearing from the Lord, or maybe not. But the enemy will try to get you to seek one of his prophets. Because the medium is a false prophet, is a prophet of the devil. But by doing so, it's coming into agreement with the devil. And you don't want to come into agreement with the devil. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. Another thing the will try to do to get you to come into agreement with them. How did Saul's men know that there was a witch at Endor? And yes, the medium is a witch. How did his men know that there was a witch at Endor? So not only would the enemy try to surround you, or the devil try to surround you with, um, with a lot of enemies, both spiritual and natural enemies, to try to get you to come into agreement with him, as if there's no way of escape. He will even have people in your inner circle to be able to point you to things. Like I mentioned before, the testimony that inspired this message. That young woman's grandmother was the one who indoctrinated her to witchcraft. There was always some kind of an exchange. In this case, Saul went to go see the woman and he disguised himself in doing so. If you find yourself doing something that causes you to compromise, that causes you to have to hide where you don't want people knowing about it, that's a sign that you're heading down the wrong path. This woman eventually conjured up Samuel's spirit 
And it was actually Samuel's spirit because the Bible tells us that Samuel appeared. The Bible also tells us that when she was seeing into the spiritual realm, she saw evil spirits coming out of the ground. And then she saw Samuel. Her seeing the evil spirits didn't disturb her because that's what she was working with. So like those of you, also nothing enemy uses, loss. There's some people who have lost a family member and they will see a medium or spiritus or a loved one. And they're trying to see that medium or spiritus with the hopes of connecting or reconnecting with a family member. Because some people are thinking that they feel this presence around them and they feel as if it's a deceased loved one accompanying them. But the Bible tells us, it's appointed unto man once to die and after that is judgment. So those family members are not lingering around anymore. Um, there's some things I won't get into, but those family members are not lingering anymore. And they'll go to see someone, like a medium, who will speak to a familiar spirit. That familiar spirit will use information based on that loved one and will relay things and may make the person think that he or she's actually communicating with a deceased family member. But in this case, the Lord allowed Samuel to come up. And this was when the time when there was Abraham's bosom. Because in Luke 16, Jesus told a parable about Lazarus and how Lazarus was a beggar. He died. And there was a rich man. Abraham, or Lazarus went into Abraham's bosom. He was with Abraham. The rich man was in hell, being tormented. He wanted Lazarus to even dip his finger in some water so he could have something to drink. Because there's no moisture in hell. It is a dry place. Um, so there are the saints who were in Abraham's bosom until Christ died. When he died, he went into, the, into Abraham's bosom. He preached to those saints. And that's why after Christ was resurrected, that hundreds of people were spotted. People who were dead were spotted, walking around. But I don't want to go too much into that depth, but it was actually Samuel's spirit that the Lord allowed to come up, which stunned the medium because she was expecting a familiar spirit to give her some deceptive information. But it was actually Samuel. And Samuel prophesied that the following day, Saul and his sons were going to die. When you go to see a medium or a spiritus, you're coming into an agreement with death. The lady also killed an animal and fed it to Saul. Oftentimes there's a spiritual exchange where either that work of iniquity will do the sacrifice or they will call upon that person, the person who's consulting with them, to make a sacrifice. The sacrifice may involve blood, which is the highest form of sacrifice. That's why the blood of Jesus is so powerful, because the blood of Jesus cleanses all sin and unrighteousness. And I say this now up front, and prayerfully I'll say it again at the end. If you have sold your soul to the devil, you can repent of your sins. Because one of the things the enemy will try to make it seem as if once you've made that deal, that it is a binding covenant. And yes, that is true. It is a binding covenant until matched and overcome by the blood of Jesus. So if you've made that deal with the devil, whether knowingly or unknowingly, by repenting and with the superior blood of Jesus Christ, it will destroy that demonic covenant. So when the Lord tells us, come out from among them, you can come out from among them. Don't listen to the devil's lie. He can always pull up that covenant and say, hey, you sign here. But the blood of Jesus Christ, in Colossians, it speaks about the blood wiping away every handwriting of ordinance that is trying to speak against us. So the blood of Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus, can set you free from the captivity. So remember that. What will happen sometimes is people will actually make a sacrifice. Maybe they'll sacrifice an animal or maybe they'll sacrifice their child or, or a child. It could be an actual sacrifice or it could be they give that work of iniquity a photograph of a child and put that child basically on, on an altar as a sacrifice. And that's how that child may not be able to go ahead or that child may get propositioned by the devil later on because the devil may be like, Here, he owns the rights to that person because someone in, a position of, uh, someone in a position of authority made that deal with the devil 
but handed over a child instead. It may be like, oh, that doesn't sound right. In Matthew 27, at around the time of Jesus' crucifixion, these Israelites, they said something, and um, <laughs> they handed over their children, whether they realize it or not. And sometimes people use words, and they come into agreement with the enemy. There was a point when the Apostle Paul, the Jews were against him, and they made a covenant that they wouldn't eat or drink until they killed him. And that's one of those, I won't even say it directly, that's one of those over their dead body type covenants. And some people make those covenants. Like, getting into a marriage is a covenant, and it can be broken. And some people, they like, for example, receive that divorce decree. But they took that till death do us part, part of the covenant seriously. And they're like, they're not giving up on the other person. Even though there's a divorce decree, the marriage is over. They have that over their dead body type covenant. And they'll even try pursuing the other person, the person who divorced them. That's one of the ways the enemy also uses as a portal to get people into witchcraft. Trying to get into a relationship or get back into a relationship. The enemy preys upon people's desperation. But in this case, <laughs> it was just utter foolishness. You have to be careful who you come into agreement with. So in Matthew 27, starting verse 20, at around the time prior to Jesus' um, crucifixion, when the members of the Sanhedrin were trying to get Jesus crucified, and they were trying to get the crowd on their side, Pontius Pilate was reluctant to go through the crucifixion and says, but the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. So the people, so the chief priests wanted the people to side with them to put Jesus to death. You have to be careful who you come into agreement with. I have recorded messages before about praying witchcraft prayers. I mentioned about the end of a marriage. You have to be careful about someone coming to you about touching and agreeing in prayer about for, forming a, um, or the Lord bringing someone back to them or to them because it may not have been the Lord's will in the first place. And they're trying to violate a person's will by praying witchcraft prayers, even though you may use the Lord's name because it's not in accordance with the Lord's will, you've opened the door to the enemy which is another way of handing your soul over to the devil by praying witchcraft prayers. So you're praying, it may seem like a good thing, like for the reconstitution of a, of a union, which may not have been, or to bring people together. And because you're violating someone else's will, you're engaging in witchcraft. You open a door to the enemy. So you have to be careful who you partner with, who you're coming into agreement with. Consult with the Lord yourself to know what His will is lest you find yourself opposing the Lord. So you may be praying and you may be using the Lord, Jesus' name, but because the lingering devils know what you're praying is not in accordance with the Lord's will, they will go and afflict a person. And there are times when it may work. But in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18, you see that Joseph was going to put away Mary. He was going to quietly divorce her. But an angel spoke to him in a dream. If you're praying those witchcraft prayers, you are conjuring and commissioning a devil to go afflict a person. And one of the signs of a witchcraft prayer, if you're praying and you're saying to the Lord, do not allow so-and-so to sleep until so-and-so does this. That example with Joseph, Joseph was asleep and the Lord had an angel quietly speak to him. The Lord doesn't need to pressure anyone by not allowing them to sleep. Because not allowing a person to sleep that's how, that, that's the work of demons. That's the work of demons. So if you've prayed or you are praying about do not allow someone to sleep, you are conjuring up devils, even if you're using Jesus' name. Back to the scripture. But the governor said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, 
Barabbas. Oh boy. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? Before continue, his plan was simply to scourge Jesus, make an example of him, and send him on his way. And he even offered up Barabbas as a solution. And I'm not saying that Pontius Pilate was an upstanding guy, but in this case, he was giving him a way out. The Bible tells us that the Lord will make a way of escape for us. He knows about temptation. So when the enemy is trying to do things, do not overlook when the Lord is giving you a way of escape to not come into agreement with the enemy. They all said, crucify him. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they all kept shouting, all the more saying, crucify him. Like with the divorce example I gave earlier, you may be thinking that, oh, so-and-so divorced so-and-so, and that's cruel. And you may think that's the evil, and you're praying against it. And like how they're saying, crucify him to Jesus, you're praying these prayers, basically asking the Lord to crucify someone. Do not allow so-and-so to sleep, conjuring up devils. Again, the enemy is very subtle. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands and in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it, or see to that yourselves. And all the people said, His blood shall be upon us. They're inviting a curse upon themselves. But here's how bad it is for their children. Because it says, And on our children. Then he released Barabbas for them, but after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. So Pontius Pilate just wanted to simply scourge Jesus because he didn't find an evil in him. But they wanted Jesus crucified. And then they took a curse upon themselves by saying Jesus' blood upon them and their children. And that's how sometimes people hand their children over to the devil. And these children are innocent. Don't even know it. Innocent. So they realize it. They effectively sacrificed their children to the devil. There's another example where the sacrifice this time was more overt. And some people have done this. That's part of, um, like some celebrities, and you may hear them like sing songs and they tell you that they sold their soul to the devil. In some ways that the enemy shows that the individual has sold his or her soul to him. For example, in the case of those who grew up in church and the enemy offered them fame as a part of renouncing the Lord and literally trampling on the blood of Jesus, like how those people are saying that the blood of Jesus upon them and their children, you will see that these people, that when they're in church, they were dressed conservatively. But when they start going to the enemy's camp, as a part of renouncing Jesus, they started dressing more provocatively, in some cases, demonically. You may see them in music videos, and they may go from one scene where they're dressed like an angel of the Lord, white and pure, and then another scene, you see them dressed as a fallen angel, dressed in black, clipped wings. Those are signs. Now for some people, they may not have made that commitment to the devil, but because they start dressing like that, start dressing as dark characters, that's the way the enemy is luring them in, trying to get them to sear their conscience as with hot iron. But in some cases, it's just simple fame. I mean, if a person, for example, is a singer, maybe at best, that person can go to a church that seats 10,000 people, but the devil will offer them an opportunity to sing to a stadium. <laughs> like what's coming up soon, Super Bowl Sunday. That's when the devil's primary stage for his false prophets, those musicians, where they can sing 
in front of a stadium full of people with millions of people watching all over the world. And sometimes an, an entertainer was at the pinnacle but kind of lost, lost his or her um, clout in the industry and has to make a sacrifice. And the person doesn't do it directly. A family member or friend may end up getting killed. And that constitutes the sacrifice. And next thing you know, that tragedy happens and the person's career resurges. Sometimes the sacrifices, they're done undercover. Other times it's covert where it seems like it's an accident, but it truly wasn't. An accidental overdose that wasn't an accident, etc. Another example, or an example of people making outright sacrifices to the devil to obtain a certain result is in 2 Kings 3 and also in verse 26 when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him what is the enemy trying to overcome you with or make it seem as if you've been overcome that you need some extra help so the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him he was fighting against the Israelites children of the Most High God He took with him 700 men and drew swords to break through to the king of Edom, but they could not. So he was trying to get back up in the natural with the king of Edom. So it's like someone trying to get that prayer partner. And that's why sometimes you have covens or witches operating in covens. So they can quote unquote touch and agree to try to work their, <laughs> work their dark arts because there's power and agreement, both in the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. But he could not. This also applies to how sometimes someone has something against you, but the person cannot defeat you naturally. The person can't give arguments that are more persuasive than you. So the person tries something in secret. The occult refers to secret knowledge. So the person tries something occultic in an effort to gain that victory. Maybe the person can't get you into a relationship naturally, so the person tries something occultic in order to get you into a relationship. And it continues, Then he took his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, and offered him as a burnt offering on the wall. So the king of Moab killed his own son as a sacrifice to his god, and Chemosh was the god of the Moabites. And there came great wrath against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. So isn't something, the children of God, they had God on their side, but this devil, or this man, made the highest form of sacrifice there was at that time, which was a blood sacrifice. His own son who was supposed to reign in his stead. Some people are that desperate, others are that wicked. Do not let desperation become your inspiration because when you're desperate, the enemy likes to come in and he will offer you things in your moment of desperation and he may offer you things and seem as if there are no strings attached but there's a string attached. He wants your soul. He wants your soul. So even though the children of Israel had God on their side and not to say that the devil is more powerful than the Lord but he sacrificed his son, effectively raised hell and the Israelites, they return home. Some people, they do that. They offer their children as a sacrifice. Offer their grandchildren as a sacrifice. Sometimes the sacrifice is that that child will grow up and serve the devil. Other times, that sacrifice or that child will end up getting killed at some point in time as a sacrifice to the devil. And it could be an agreement where that child will grow up. For, say for example, the person wants fame. The enemy will give the person fame for say for example 30 years. And the, the anchor point for that is that that child who become a sacrifice, the devil will give that child 30 years to live. And in that child's 30th year, if that child doesn't come to Christ, 
and get his protection, get covered under that blood, then that child will grow up and die at age 30 because of something a parent or a grandparent did. People are still doing this more wickedness today. I mentioned um, Genesis 3 regarding how covert the enemy is. I'm also going to look at how he did or tried to do to Jesus, which is what he will do with us in our moment of desperation. In Luke 4, after Jesus had been baptized, the Holy Spirit descended and rested upon him in the form of a dove. The Father spoke from heaven, saying, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. In Luke, 1, in Luke 4, starting verse 1, it states, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he became hungry. So the Lord was hungry. He said, desperate for food. So what's the enemy going to try to do? And the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, I start off by saying, the Father spoke from heaven, saying, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus knew he was the Son of God. In Luke 2, when Jesus was 12, he spoke about being about the Father's business. He knew that he was the Son of God. The devil tried to get you to question your identity in Christ. And when you know your identity in Christ, when you know the Word of God, it will help you in thwarting the devil's attacks. Again, the enemy will try to use your desperation for your inspiration. And he only needs to come into agreement with him. So the first part of this was, if you are the Son of God. That's one of the things he was challenging. Jesus, he didn't need to even answer that question. But it continues, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. The devil tried to give you a task to do. And if you do that task, then you're coming into agreement with him. So it may seem, Jesus could have just turned the stone into bread and proven the devil wrong to say, hey, I am a son of God. One of the things the enemy also uses, I mentioned fear earlier. Desperation, oppression. Another thing is doubt. I had mentioned it indirectly about how he um, tried to get Eve to doubt the word of God. If the enemy can doubt your identity in Christ, if the enemy can get you to doubt the word of God, for example, you may do things using biblical principles, using the word of God, and it seems as if they don't work. And the enemy will try to get you to doubt the Lord. Even to the point you may feel like you need to burn the Bible because it doesn't do what it said it should do. But the enemy is trying to plant seeds of doubt. You can say he has nothing to lose, even though his punishments are being multiplied, because he's ready to condemn to hell. And he will do things to try to get you to doubt the word of God, doubt your identity in Christ. So tell the stone to become bread. Try to get you to use your gifts in an ungodly manner. But Jesus would not play that game. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. So Jesus was not going to allow the devil to use his hunger, his desperation, to come to agreement with him. Because sometimes that's all the devil wants, for you to come into agreement with him. He may try to project negative thoughts into you and get you to come into agreement with those thoughts. And not to say that you sell your soul by coming into agreement with those thoughts, but you start heading down that road. You don't want to give the enemy an inroad into your life. You need to shut him down. Repent frequently. Plead the blood of Jesus, the blood that cleanses all sin and unrighteousness. Cut the devil off. The devil is persistent. So the Lord shut him down at one point, but the enemy came back. And he led him up, up, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Be careful of the enemy trying to use you when you're at a low point and try to bring you up. Um, the Apostle Paul mentioned that he wanted to go, and go somewhere, but he couldn't because Satan resisted him. There are times when the enemy put satanic, demonic blocks in your life to make it seem as if you can't progress. 
And as a result, he tried to make it seem as if he is the way out. And if you do what he says, then he'll open those doors. But remember, Jesus is more powerful. Isaiah prophesied it, and it's written in Revelation 3, that Jesus, he has the keys of David. He opens doors that no one can shut, and he shuts doors that no one can open. The devil can shut a door, the Lord can open it. The Lord can open a door, the devil can't shut it. So what the enemy tries to do is put up blocks to make it seem as if they had to go through him in order to get to the Lord. It doesn't work that way. The veil was rent upon Jesus' crucifixion. You have direct access to the Lord. If you're already a believer, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, which meant you've been purchased at a price. That price is the blood of Jesus. In Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, the Lord said, come out from among them. It also tells us that we've been purchased at a price. There's no fellowship between light and dark. So no matter what the enemy gets you into, again, because of the blood of Jesus, you can come out from among them. You can come out, no matter what. So the devil led the Lord when he was at a low point. In fact, it was already a low point because Jesus was made lower than the angels for a time when he took on the human flesh. And that is one of his lowest points here on earth. The devil is trying to exalt him, showing the kingdoms of the world. Promotion does not come from the east, the west, or the south. It comes from God. The enemy will try to promote you, even promote you prematurely. One thing the enemy is very skilled at is recognizing people with godly callings. You may be in a church. You may know you have a calling from the Lord, and it's like no one else sees it. And the enemy may send a work of iniquity, a witch, for example, pretending to be a Christian, and try to offer you a promotion, meaning, oh, you're a powerful man or woman of God, and try to give you a, like, opportunity to preach, opportunity to minister, where you want getting it somewhere else. Those are ways of selling one's soul to the devil. Even Christianity, you have to be careful what you're willing to do. For example, to preach. There's some people, some ministers, they're looking at you and they see that you know the truth about tithing under the new covenant and that we're not required to give 10% of our income. In fact, back in the old covenant, they weren't giving 10% of their income, meaning money. It was about agriculture, crops and livestock. But if you're preaching and you're speaking the truth about tithing, you end up disqualifying yourself from many preaching engagements because those churches with the overhead, many are not preaching the truth about tithing. And it's not because the pastor doesn't know it. It's because the pastor has, a, has an overhead. And by telling people about tithing, they get a steady stream of income which allows for budget, budgeting. They may tell you that because you're not tithing means you don't trust God when they're being hypocrites because they don't trust God to tell the truth about tithing so that you're not obligated to give 10% of your income every month. Because the Lord could have you give 10% of your income to the church one month. The following month, he may have you give 10, 15, 20% of your income to someone who's homeless. But they want you to bring your money to the church so that they can budget to keep lights on, the doors open. And in some cases, the Lord wants to shut those institutions down. But they're not telling you the truth. And if you're speaking the truth about stuff like that, then you won't be invited to preach out of fear that you may tell people the truth. Or if you get invited, they may ask you to renounce or not say anything about tithing, for example. Or if you get invited to preach and the Lord gives you a message for that church, they may try to dictate to you what you should preach about when you have an in-season, on-time word from the Lord. And if you compromise, those are ways you have to be careful. Sometimes the church may have a, a bona fide minister, someone who's committed to the Lord. Other times, it may be someone the devil propped up in a preaching position and in, in order to be on that, be in the church preaching, to be in the conference arena, you have to stick with their script. You can't speak out against certain things. If you are preaching this thing about homosexuality being a sin, you won't be able to preach certain places unless you renounce your beliefs unless you start preaching what the devil wants you to preach as opposed to the Word of God. Those are some of the compromises people have to make. If you're compromising, 
you're heading down a path to send your soul to the enemy. And the enemy will even offer you a church, several churches to oversee, if you will bow to him. In Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar built a, a golden statue. And when they heard the musical instruments playing, they had to bow. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego refused to bow. There's even a song about how they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, they wouldn't burn. So because they wouldn't bend, because they wouldn't bow to worship that idol, even though they were cast in the fire, the Lord ensured they wouldn't burn. Some people were bending, some people were bowing because they were afraid to burn. And I'm saying a lot of things I didn't expect to say, but there are a lot of, a lot of ways where the enemy tries to come in. And he, a lot of times, by compromising, by compromising. So when you're low, he will even put blocks in your way to put you to the low point, to make it seem as if the only way out is to bow to him. But be like Meshach, Shadrach, or Abednego, where you say, your God can deliver you. And even if he doesn't deliver you, that he's still good, he's still God, and you refuse to serve another God. So the devil literally offered Jesus many kingdoms. And it continues, and the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, referring to what happened in the Garden of Eden, and I will give it to whomever I wish. I pause. So the devil was offering Jesus the world. And he was saying that it was handed over to him. One of the things about that is, the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It was always the Lord's. It was kind of like the devil had a lease on it. He wasn't the owner. God was. For God, the heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. The devil didn't own anything. And especially now that Jesus has been resurrected, Jesus has the keys to death and hell. The devil doesn't own anything. Now he can take some souls to hell with him. He gets you to sin, gets you to come into agreement with him. But there's redemption in the name of the blood of Jesus. So what did Jesus, what Jesus have to, would Jesus have to do in order for the devil to give him the kingdom? Now the thing is, the devil is the father of lies. When he speaks lies, he's speaking his native tongue. But he will also tell the truth. But he'll tell the truth in a way as a bait. And as I've said before, in other places, the devil uses the truth as bait to get you to swallow the hook, which is a lie. But he's feeding a line. And once he gets that hook and you're on his line, then he'll drag you to and fro and eventually down to hell with him unless you repent. But the devil continued, Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall be yours. Now, can you imagine the devil like salivating, like, if you worship me, and thinking that he's desperate, just maybe he'll worship. Well, Jesus was hungry. But he wasn't that hunger for bread that he'd do it the devil's way. He wasn't that hunger for bread that he'd be obedient to the devil. Jesus came to redeem the earth. But would he be desperate to worship the devil? The devil is literally looking for someone to lick his boots. And the sad thing is, this is after what's written in um, Isaiah 14 about how the devil sought to exalt his throne to be like the Most High. And because of that, he was cast down to the pit. He's still trying to get worship. So imagine the devil there salivating, salivating, wondering if Jesus was going to worship him. Jesus answered him, It is written. Again, all these things with the enemy, no matter how desperate you are, no matter how hard the things are, keep on coming back at him with the word. The word is the sword of the spirit. Every time you use a word, you're cutting him down. You shall worship your, 
You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In that sharp rebuke, Jesus was reminding the devil that the Lord, God himself in the flesh, was his God. The lower serves the higher. So no matter how hungry Jesus was, he wasn't going to obey the devil. No matter how badly Jesus wanted to redeem the world, he wasn't going to worship the devil and do it. But many people today, the devil offers them the world. And they worship him, one way or another. Sometimes it's something seemingly innocuous, and then becomes more overt where you may have someone who grew up in a church openly defying Jesus. Essentially trampling on his blood. But even for them, there's mercy. There's grace. There's still time to repent. Because in a testimony the person sent me, and I've heard other people testify about being in the dark before, and how after many years, the Lord delivered them. So there are people who have done things, cursed God out, like in the book of Job, like one of the things the enemy was trying to do was get Job to curse the God and die, like Job's wife mentioned, but Job refused. Some people have cursed God out, they haven't died, that means they still have mercy. A lot of them, they still have a chance to repent, so no matter what you've done, you can repent, there's power in the blood and the name of Jesus. So no matter speaking, Jesus is like, I'm not worshiping you, devil. In the book of Jude, it speaks about how the archangel Michael rebuked Satan. And he said, the Lord rebuke you. When the enemy comes at you, you have to say, the Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you. In Matthew 16, we see how Jesus had asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And they start saying, Jeremiah, Isaiah, that prophet. And it was like, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ. And then Jesus said that the Father had shown him that. But in the same chapter, Jesus told them about how he was going to go to Jerusalem and how the elders and the priests would prosecute him or persecute him and even put him to death. And Peter put him aside and rebuked him and was like, oh no, that will happen. But Jesus looked at Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me. And that's how you have to look at people sometimes. It could be someone close to you. And you look at them and you say, Get behind me, Satan. Or the Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you, Satan. The person may be stunned because the person may not realize what's going on. But you have to handle that devil that is trying to use that person as an emissary, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Oh, another device of the enemy. The enemy may appear in your dream, and the enemy may try to come as someone in a position of authority. For example, the Bible tells us, Paul wrote, rebuke not an elder, and about entreating as a father. Now, it doesn't mean a young person cannot rebuke a, an elder, but we should truly treat them as a father or mother. And what the enemy may do, the enemy may come into your dream masquerading as like an actual elder of your church, your pastor, or even your parents, even Jesus himself. The enemy may come into your dream, do something, masquerading as that, and in the dream you may be trying to figure out what's going on. But the enemy is trying to get you to come into agreement, and what is one of the things that's stopping you from rebuking the devil in the dream is because he is appearing as someone who is an elder and trying to get you to not violate scriptures but the thing is there are times in the Bible where the Lord had someone rebuke another like in Matthew 23 when Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees and the scribes it doesn't mean they were the same age there were, some of them were elders so there's a time for it so don't let the devil twist scriptures and speaking of twisting scriptures we're going to get to that next so Lord he rebuked the devil he wouldn't worship him. He says, And he led him to Jerusalem, 
and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. As I've mentioned before, sometimes what the enemy is trying to give you is a, an exalted position in Christendom to where whenever there is a conference or conferences, you become like the featured speaker. They could tout you as being the next Billy Graham, the next Reinhard Bonnke. But um, the Lord didn't promote you. It was the devil. So you have to be careful about even the devil trying to give you speaking engagements. So he took Jesus to Jerusalem. For some of you, maybe in a small town, and the devil may want to try to take you to Houston, Dallas, California, places like where there are large churches and large congregations, Florida, and try to get you to, on one of those stages. Atlanta. Be careful, especially if you have to compromise. So again, the devil will even try to get you to the pinnacle or the seeming pinnacle of Christendom if you do things his way. And you don't necessarily have to publicly renounce Jesus. Just follow his script. So he said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written. So when he tests the spirit, it's not about it not it is not just about hearing the quote unquote word of God. You have to you have to test the spirits by ensure it's in accordance with his word, his will, and his way. Is God gonna have you try to kill yourself to prove something? So the devil is using scriptures in an attempt to incite that. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So you may hear scriptures, and it may sound good, and you may be thinking that it's God, but it's the devil. If you've never been under serious spiritual warfare, let me tell you as one who have. Um, the only limits the devil has are those the Lord has imposed upon him. In the book of Job, initially he could not touch Job, so the devil afflict, stole his, life, his livestock, killed his ten children. But then the Lord told him later on that he could touch Job, but he could not kill him. So the Lord established limits for the devil. If the devil had free reign, oh my Lord. And like some of you, you're going through things, and you may be wondering, where's, where's the Lord in all of this? The fact that you're not dead, the fact that the devil wasn't able to drag you down into pits of hell, means the Lord is with you. So he tried using scriptures. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. So the devil tried tempting Jesus three times to get him to come into agreement with him. But the Lord refused but he said the devil will be back so you may go through seasons of spiritual warfare and there is a season for everything there are seasons of spiritual warfare just keep on using the word to rebuke the devil every time you use it you're cutting him down every time you use it you're cutting him down so I mentioned about the enemy trying to exalt you promoting your Christendom and may seem like it's from the Lord, but you had to test the spirit. You truly do. As the saying goes, not everything that's good is of God. If you by chance obeyed the enemy, and you may have thought it was the Lord, and you've been having dreams where you're locked up, or dreams where you find yourself flying. Now, if you have dreams about flying, there are two sides of that. If it's a dream because you are a prophet or you are prophetic, you may have dreams and there are godly dreams where you're in control of your flight. You're in control of the speed of your flight. There's no fear in flying. 
and the flight allows you to soar to great heights above the fray where you can see things at a distance like Isaiah is called the eagle-eyed prophet where you can see more for example you're above the trees so you can see more you can see further but if the enemy has your soul you may find yourself flying and if you've ever, ever seen or heard about the movie called E.T. extraterrestrial from years ago and nowadays we know that deemed extraterrestrial are actually devils but there is a portion where they were riding bicycles, the little children were riding bicycles and because E.T. was with them they start flying and E.T. was in the in a cage, a basket in the front of the bicycle and the young man was riding it. If you find yourself having a dream where it feels as if you've been taken up and someone's pushing you, you don't have control of where you're going and you may even be fearful, those are signs that the enemy is making your soul fly. And it may sound improbable, but for some of you, you've had those experiences. You may have not have known what was going on. And the enemy counts on your ignorance, your lack of knowledge. The Bible tells us that the Lord said that his people perish from a lack of knowledge. The Apostle Paul wrote about not being ignorant of the devil's devices, lest he get an advantage of us. So if you've been to a prophetic conference or seen a prophet or just straight outright went to a false prophet, a medium, a spiritist, something of a sort, a voodoo worker, obi-man, roots worker, and afterwards you start having dreams about being locked up, you're flying unwillingly. There is a biblical precedence for it. And again, I've mentioned about the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus. The enemy, he may try to do those things illegally against a Christian who's in right standing with the Lord. And when that comes, it's going to be trouble for him. If the Lord allows it, it's only going to be for a season and the enemy's going to have to pay. So this thing about your soul being caged or your soul being made to fly. In Ezekiel 13, starting verse 17, the Lord said, Now you, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people who are prophesying from their own inspiration prophesying from their own inspiration. Those are demonic prophecies. There are times when people tell you about prophesying certain things, you have to be careful about what you're saying. But with these people, they're prophesying, and these prophecies are actually casting curses. Sometimes you can tell that people are cursing you or trying. You may have dreams, or you may close your eyes and you have a vision where you see like rocks are being thrown at you. Those represent curses. You may see fire darts. And the fire dart may actually be someone shooting at you. And the bullet that's coming at you represents a fiery dart. Or you may have dreams where you have maggots in your ears. Or you can hear people speaking about you. The Lord may actually hear you speak, hear people speaking against you. You may have a dream where you see what the people are doing. The Lord may take you up in a vision. There are different ways. There are times you may feel as if you're getting a headache like localized in one spot, or you may have a stabbing sensation in your back. Those are signs of people are prophesying against you, false prophecies, casting curses. And the Lord continued, prophesy against them and say, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the woman who sew magic bands on all wrists and make veils for the heads of persons of every stature to hunt down their lives. Lives is also translated as souls. So to hunt down souls, hunt down lives. And where it says, um, to sew magic bands of all wrist. Be careful about going to like churches or conferences and they're selling you like anointed wristbands. That may constitute a charm to assign a devil to you. Anointed prayer cloth. This means about make veils for the heads of persons. Like anointed prayer shawls. You have to be careful that the anointing isn't an ungodly anointing. You may have a dream or a vision where it's like someone throws a blanket over you. That is, a, that is an example of a veil. And the Lord is showing you that the enemy is trying to hunt your soul. It's trying to cover you. Because if you feel as if you're invisible, like you should have been promoted by now, opportunities are passing you by. 
in the spiritual realm, the enemy is trying to block you to his leg, to where you feel invisible. And it says, and the Lord continues, Will you hunt down the lives, souls, of my people, but preserve the lives of others for yourselves? For handfuls of barley and fragments of bread, you have profaned me to my people, to put to death some who should not die. So yes, in some cases, they're hunting souls and they're killing people. It doesn't mean they go to hell, but they're killing people. And to keep others alive who should not live by your lying to my people who listen to your lies. So again, be careful about listening to false prophets, listening to their lies. If someone tells you, for example, such and such is going to happen and they keep on telling you stuff's going to happen and it doesn't. At best, a lying prophet, but more likely, a false prophet. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I am against your magic bands by which you hunt lives as birds and I will tear them from your arms and I will let them go even those lives whom you hunt as birds I'll read that again but from the King James version of the Bible and that's Ezekiel 13 verse 20 where it says wherefore thus saith the Lord God behold I am against your pillows wherefore there hunt the souls to make them fly I will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly so if you're having dreams about flying and it doesn't set right with your spirit or there's a spirit of fear or you've been led into darkness the enemy is trying to hunt your souls in the NASB version it mentioned about hunting lives as birds Isaiah 91 not Isaiah Psalm 91 speaks about the snare of the fowler so be careful I will also tear off your veils and deliver my people from your hands there's deliverance from Jesus and he will only allow certain things for so long and if the enemy is tampering with you someone whose walk is upright with the Lord the enemy will have to pay and they will no longer be in your hands to be hunted and you will know that I am the Lord the Lord is going to prove himself mighty because you disheartened the righteous with falsehood when I did not cause him grief but have encouraged the wicked not to turn from his wicked way and, pres <laughs> and preserve his life I pause for a second about in the end encouraged wicked to not turn from their wicked ways the end will use people's desperation like hunger and poverty go hand in hand so when the enemy tried tempting Jesus with bread to turn the stone into bread he was trying to get him to feed his hunger many people grew up in a poor environment and as a result the enemy tries to lure them with money Jesus tells us that no one can serve two masters no one can serve God and mammon mammon being a god of earth of pleasures being a god of money so there's some people who started off poor and the enemy uses money to lure them into his camp and there's some people because the enemy will also give them demonic powers and because of these de demonic powers they do not want to renounce those demonic powers some people in Christendom where I mentioned earlier about how the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and put him on the pinnacle the Holy Spirit gives us gifts as he wills some people may covet other people's gifts or the enemy may offer them a the Kundalini spirit the false Holy Spirit and they'll get these demonic powers that mimics the powers of the Holy Spirit and some people because they want those powers because if they have those powers then it may cause them to have more speaking engagements but a part of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit just doesn't give us gifts he also gives us fruit of the Holy Spirit so there are people who are gifted spiritually gifted but they lack the fruits of the Holy Spirit 
It is better to be like someone who only has one gift and not considered very anointed, but to be but to bear abundant fruit of the Holy Spirit than to be someone who is gifted with no fruit. When Jesus cursed the fig tree, it was because it had leaves and no fruit. Leaves are like those gifts. The Lord wants fruit. If you have leaves, gifts, he wants fruit. He wants fruit. And some people, they have risen to in ministry positions because they have a false Holy Spirit. And continues. Therefore, you women will no longer see false visions or practice divination and I will deliver my people out of your hand. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. So if you find yourself in a position where you're having dreams about being caged or you're flying, seek the Lord for deliverance and know that no matter how badly bound the enemy thinks he has you, the Lord God can deliver you. The men at the Gadarenes had thousands of demons, a legion of demons, and Jesus cast them all out at the same time. The Bible speaks about that two or three witnesses establish every matter. So whereas I just read from Ezekiel regarding a soul being ensnared or a soul being made to fly, the prophet Jeremiah also said some things as the Lord communicated to him. In Jeremiah 5, starting verse 25, it states, Your iniquities have turned these things away, and your sins have withheld good from you. For wicked men are found among my people. They watch like fowlers, lying in wait. They set a trap to catch men, like a cage full of birds. So their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and rich. They are fat, they are sleek. They also excel in deeds of wickedness. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the orphan, that they may prosper. And they do not defend the rights of the poor. Shall I not punish these people, declares the Lord, on such a nation such as this, Shall I not avenge myself? An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule on their own authority. And my people love it so. But what will you do in the end of it? So the Lord spoke about wicked men among his people so some of the things I've described they're going on in houses of God no wonder Peter wrote that judgment begins in the house of God he also mentioned about the righteous being scarcely saved so the enemy he has a lot of snares out there to include in Christianity similarly to how he took Jesus to Jerusalem the center of the Jewish faith and took him up on the pinnacle of the temple. Even the devil is offering Christians, ministers, opportunity to go to the top, but it's not in a godly way. And what he wants them to do is to compromise, to sell their souls. If the Lord called you as to serve Him as a minister and you're preaching fire messages and you find out that in order to advance there are certain things you can't speak out against publicly, you're on your way. And the enemy, he tries subtly and then becomes more overt. As I mentioned earlier, there are times when people sell their souls to the devil. They were believers. The enemy gets them to compromise just a little. Jesus spoke about a little, little leaven 
leaven, or the Bible speaks about a little leaven, leavening the whole lump. And Jesus speaks about the leaven of the Pharisees being hypocrisy. And one thing the enemy wants to do is put people in a situation to make them seem like hypocrites. To where a person is a Christian, maybe struggling to get ahead, then he comes with a, a quote-unquote easy way out. And he gets a person to compromise. And then he gets them to compromise even more. Until they are a shadow of themselves. In a sense, that's what it looks like when a person's soul has been sold. They become a shadow of themselves. Inside, it's, it's empty. And when they get what the devil has offered them, they feel empty. When Jesus refused the devil's offer to turn stone into bread, the Lord said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In John 4, Jesus had an encounter with a Samaritan woman at the well. And he told her about those who drink from him, from their belly will flow rivers of living waters. They won't thirst again. Like the devil with the food, how many times have we been hungry throughout our lives, eating food, maybe ate a lot of it, but then we became hungry again? Some things are carnal, they're temporal, they won't last for a short time. And when Jesus, I'll read it again, Matthew 16, 26. When Jesus said, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? There are many things people give for their soul. I mentioned earlier about how some people sacrifice their children. Some people, they will not sacrifice their children. And the enemy will try to get to their children in some way to get them to compromise. There's some preachers, for example, they used to preach out against homosexuality. But then when their children got involved in that lifestyle, and then a minister softens his or her stance. And the enemy wants us to soften our stance. So sometimes it's not the person making a quote unquote child sacrifice. The enemy gets to a child some loved one, and next you know, that person starts compromising. That's what the enemy is after. We cannot afford to compromise. We cannot afford to negotiate with the devil. Jesus didn't entertain him. Many people have received things in exchange for their souls, and they ate, in a sense, but afterwards they found themselves hungry. And when they go back to the devil for more, he requires a greater sacrifice, a more public and sacrilegious sacrifice. Initially you may see a person, and a person may have some semblance of guilt, but afterwards it's like it, that person's lost. It's like the eyes go dark, becomes lifeless. The enemy is very strategic. Some things he'll do overtly, other things covertly. Either way, we have to be able to identify his works and shut him down. Anything the enemy can give you is truly temporary. I mentioned about Jesus having the keys to death and hell. Death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. The devil is going to be in the lake of fire also. So every single thing the devil has to offer you is going to be in the lake of fire. He want to get you, get you to the lake of fire with him. Jesus said that hell was created for the devil and his angels. They're fallen. They will not be allowed to repent. Now they can't repent. And his goal is to get every soul into hell with him. To suffer with him. That's how petty he is. 